Welcome back. In this micro lecture, we are going to discuss some more recent developments and some historical patterns in energy and fuels. Please take a moment and review this week's learning objectives. World War I and World War II drove major innovations in energy technology and bioenergy. By World War I, the world had rapidly converted to internal combustion engines that were powered on diesel and gasoline. Despite ethanol's popularity for well over a hundred years, oil was cheap and plentiful and became the standard fuel for use in engines. In some ways, petroleum fuels and engines were developed at the same time and grew up together. This technology fit the fuel and the fuel fit the technology. This is extremely important to remember when assessing new fuels, since anything that burns has the potential to be a good fuel in an engine designed to use it. We may suffer more from limited engine designs than we do from limited fuel options. The 1970s energy crisis is an interesting case study with current relevance. History often goes in circles for reasons that baffle historians. Many of the bioenergy technologies being developed today were researched in the 1970s during the energy crisis. Ironically, many of the technologies researched in the 1970s were based on ideas that had been practiced more than a hundred years earlier to produce energy and fuels for a world going crazy for engines and struggling to find a fuel of choice. So here we are again. The price of oil has been high, and for ten years or so, there has been considerable enthusiasm for bioenergy. However, now we are potentially looking at producing more oil than we consume, and interest in bioenergy is waning again. The graphs above show what oil prices did in the 1970s, and what the balance of oil and production imports has looked like for the last 100 years. It is interesting to note that with the exception of the last 10 years, in general, the U.S. has always produced more oil than it has imported. One of my favorite stories from the 1970s is that GE, fearing a loss of gas supply for their turbines, developed a way to convert their gas turbines to a more available fuel composed of ethanol and lignin. Ethanol provided the vapor characteristics, and lignin provided the energy content. The combination was apparently quite functional. However, these days there is very little discussion about powering turbines with biomass, just burning biomass in coal plants. I show the graph of coal versus electrical generation because this discussion may get another chance. If natural gas is successful in upsetting coal as the preferred energy source because it is cleaner, more efficient, and easier to build, then the foundation of our energy infrastructure may be dramatically different. Back in the days of Edison and Westinghouse, private investment and government policy led to centralized energy production over distributed energy production. Westinghouse wanted distributed power, and Edison wanted centralized. If things continue going the way they are, our grid may someday look the way Westinghouse wanted. Distributed energy production fits bioenergy much better than centralized energy production, so from a bioenergy perspective, the conversion from coal to natural gas is a welcome development. About a hundred years after the diesel engine, biodiesel finally began to be commercially produced. Ethanol had technically been an engine fuel since the early 1800s, but we currently have more access to engines that run on biodiesel than we do ethanol engines. Why? It has nothing to do with conspiracy and everything to do with convenience and in-place investments. Biodiesel recipes had been publicly available for around 50 years before the first commercial plant was built. It is produced by modifying vegetable oil so that it functions better in most common diesel engines. Interestingly, if the engine is modified, the vegetable oil doesn't have to be. It's a fine fuel in an engine designed to use it. However, using vegetable oil to power vehicles could only ever be a regional solution, not a national solution. Vegetable oil is a fairly expensive fuel in a lot of places, but then ethanol can be as well. These days, ethanol prices, crude oil prices, and vegetable oil prices are all fairly similar. 2012 was a big year because we started commercially producing something called renewable diesel. This is different than biodiesel and has a much higher yield per ton of biomass. This was a big step for the bioenergy community. 
This refinery is owned by Kior. It utilizes 500 tons per day of biomass and produces over 13 million gallons of fuel blend stock annually. The technology utilized at this refinery is very similar to what is used at commercial petroleum refineries. Kior is currently working hard to improve the efficiency of the plants so that the economics are better. Petroleum refining is very expensive, and this expense is handled in part by taking advantage of economy of scale. Biomass cannot be used at the same economy of scale, and this presents a significant economics challenge in trying to treat biomass like petroleum. That said, this is still a very exciting development and an important step on the path towards the production of distributed renewable sources of hydrocarbon. It's finally here. In 2013, we began commercially producing cellulosic ethanol, approximately 180 years after ethanol was first used in engines. After being five years away for 20 years, cellulosic ethanol is finally a real thing and growing. This map and these statistics are only for North America, and there are equally mature developments happening in Europe and South America. The United States has been a net exporter of ethanol for over five years now, so it will be interesting to see how the industry changes as more feedstock flexible production capacity comes online. So why are we addicted to oil instead of alcohols? I'd like you to take a moment and think about this based on what you've just learned. There are a lot of good historical reasons for why we are addicted to oil instead of ethanol. This slide provides some more explanation, and for a real-world example, we're going to talk a little bit about Alaska. At $40 a barrel, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline moves 80 million U.S. dollars in oil every day, approximately 1 to 2 million barrels a day. A supertanker has the capacity for 2 to 3 million barrels of oil, and now only costs $120 million brand new. Cost is no object when it comes to oil production. Imagine drilling holes in the ground and connecting them to a pipe so that you can make 80 million US dollars a day, every day, for coming on 40 years now. Lots and lots of money. Now this isn't free money, and it cost millions and millions and millions of dollars to build the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. But it was paid off fairly quickly, and now it generates massive sums of money. If we do want to grow replacement oil, the U.S. is pretty well suited. This is a map of agricultural productivity in the world. A lot of this productivity is related to advanced agricultural practices meant to maximize productivity using lots of water, fertilizer, and pesticides. There are many environmental challenges to consider moving forward, but at the moment, North America and Europe, the world's largest consumers of petroleum, are also in possession of the most productive agricultural land in the world. To the extent that we choose to leverage this development for the production of fuels, we certainly have a lot of in-place investment. Please take a moment and review this timeline from the early 1900s to today. Bioenergy has an important role to play in supporting distributed and sustainable energy, but the history shows us we must leverage its strengths and not compete with oil directly. Bioenergy will succeed in markets where it is the better solution, not just because it's different than fossil fuels. This is a photo of the gas flares from Wyoming and North Dakota at night. It is interesting to consider the scale of this recent development, especially when compared to the lights of cities across the nation.